Maruchan superfans are everywhere. From the busy moms who want to deliver maximum flavor in a flash to dorm room diners who want to put some slurp in their step. There are a ton of copycats you could use, but if you want to bless your bowl, there's only one true Maruchan. Whether you choose instant lunch, ramen bowls, yakisoba, or restaurant quality gold, Maruchan is the only ramen worth obsessing over. Smiles for all, Maruchan. See what all the ramen hype is about at maruchan.com. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. This episode is brought to you by Undeniably Dairy. Picture a dairy farmer. Did you picture a meteorologist studying the atmosphere? How about an engineer running a biogas system that turns manure into renewable energy? Or a scientist researching nutrients to try to help reduce methane emissions from cows? A farmer is more than a farmer. To learn more about what dairy farmers are doing to make their farms more sustainable, visit usdairy.com. This podcast is brought to you by DrunkMummiesSoberMummy.com and made in association with HelloSundayMorning.org, changing the world's relationship with alcohol, one Sunday at a time. Oh, the kettle's boiled. Great. Perfect timing. Should we get started then? I'm Victoria Vanstone. I'm Lucy Good. And this is Sober Awkward. Right, Lucy, over to you. Thanks, Vic. So whatever stage you're at on your sober journey, and Vic and I are at completely different stages, you'll know that life without booze can at times feel, what do you reckon? Awkward. Lucy and I invite you to listen to our podcast where we discuss the realities of sobriety, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the cringingly embarrassing. Our honest and open chats will help you discover what it really means to be sober. Yes, we're here like a dodgy bottle of port from your nan's drink cabinet to take the edge off sobriety. And together we can learn how to feel the awkward and do it anyway. Oh, well, we're really, really excited. I mean, we're always excited with this podcast, but we're particularly excited because somehow we've managed to set up our technology. Yeah, it's a miracle. <laughs> in such a way to have our first guest on the Sober Awkward podcast. And that is somebody that I think a lot of you will have heard of before. And that's Mr. William Porter, the author of Alcohol Explained. Welcome, William. Hello. We are. We, you sound all calm. There's no I, no sign at all of the, the the drama we've had. Actually, getting all three of us yeah. talking to each other on this podcast. Yeah. I mean, William is in England, and we are in Australia, so it's a pretty much a miracle that we're all here together in us in the in the troll booth. Yes, how we've done it, I don't really know, but somehow we're only running about two hours late. Yeah, all oh, cool. We're all we're, we're all so, good. My sober, hands are relaxed shaking. People here. Yeah. <laughs> My legs are shaking. I've got a bit red, haven't I, Lucy? Because I was yeah, you did. Slightest. You went a little bit red there I knew we were yeah. in trouble when Vic, Vic's neck started going red I thought, oh, yeah. she's getting stressed I'm like a toad <laughs> <laughs> you can tell when I'm about to go because my I start to swell up <laughs> for yeah. the benefit you, of being in London I've got the whole day panning out in front of me so that's absolutely oh, I know fine. Yeah. And, and you're and it's a Sunday in London and that's what I was just worried because I said to Vic oh my god what if he needs to be at work because you work don't you as well as yeah, doing yeah, all I your do. alcohol stuff yeah so you yeah. must be a busy man um, well, funny enough, it's probably it's easier it's easier when I'm at work because I've got two young kids as well. So we've got the usual round of <laughs> oh, yeah. parties and dragging them here, there, and everywhere. Whereas when I'm at work, I can just sort of sit back and pretend to be working, and no one really pays yeah. much attention. So yes, yeah. I've 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 just sn- snuck away from a Father's Day dinner actually. Yes, it's Father's Day. <laughs> I was like, Day see you guys. I've Australia. got three young kids as well, William. So yeah, I know mm. I know how that feels to want to run away occasionally and hide. And <laughs> so, yeah. Same with Alan, our sound man, who does all our all this work for us to make these podcasts happen. And we say, are you sure you don't mind? And he, he's got four kids. He says, oh, I love just getting out of the house for the evening. Oh, In fact, yeah. between us. 
we've got nine children between us, and including <laughs> William, that's say like, eleven all of us together, and these yeah, four people. Got, so, got yeah, two of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah gosh, yeah. full on, aren't they? Full on. We love them sometimes. Do you? That's nice. <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> Right. So as we said, William is joining us all the way from our motherland, England. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. William is a lawyer living in London. He's 45 years old, married and a father of two boys, as we just said. He quit drinking in February 2014. Previously, William was a British Army par- paratrooper and served in Iraq in 2005 and 2006. He wrote Alcohol Explained back in 2015. And since then, it's become one of the go-to reads for the newly sober and the sober curious community. Um, Lucy introduced me to your book, actually, William. She read it <clears throat> and would not stop banging on about it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> nice I had to, to tell her to yeah. shut up about you at one yeah, point. Yeah. I, I, she was getting a bit <laughs> obsessive, like an obsessed fan. <laughs> yeah, you're quite, you're quite safe over there at least you're in another country yeah she might be stalking you (laughs) if you notice someone stalking you on instagram with like a fake account yeah it's lucy (laughs) no i will i'm being more serious if you listen to some of our certainly our first few podcasts i think i mentioned the book in every single one several times and i think for me the reason this is i mean i've read lots of sober literature um, as we do when we're on this sober journey but i'm quite analytical and um, I, I get overloaded with information and I don't like grey areas. For me, I like to know facts. Yeah. And I think yours was mm-hmm. the first book that was really giving us, like, this is what alcohol does to you. There's no grey area. This is what it does. So it took away a lot of that, oh, maybe it'd be all right to have a couple of drinks. Maybe it'd be all right to. No, it's not all right. You were actually laying it all down. And I, I, I found the book, I had to read several pages a few times because it was so packed full of information. Mm. Um, And also having two teenage daughters, William, I actually find myself quoting sections (laughs) from the book to them (laughs) if they go out. And like my 18 year old might say, oh, you know, we we don't remember what happened between this part and this part of the night. So I explained to them what happens (laughs) in their brain when they they black out. So it's been hugely helpful for my own personal journey um, but also just so bloody interesting to know what alcohol is doing to us so thank you for putting it out there it's like no other book around on, um, on you, the sober circuit have you got a special room lucy where you've got cutouts of william's face like <laughs> all over the all over the walls and with and scrawlings yeah. Yeah. yeah scrawlings of a maniac yeah, on the in, wall it's in the basement <laughs> Excellent. Um, we did put a shout out, William, on our group. I have a, a community group, the Drunk Mummy Sober Mummy group, and uh, they, I put it out there for our group to ask you some questions. But actually, they didn't right. ask hardly any questions at all. All they wanted to say was how much they loved your book. Um, one woman said it should have been on the high school reading list. Agreed. It changed my life. Thank you. And another lady said, in a very Aussie way, I love his bloody guts. <laughs> Which yeah, I think probably Australian. Lucy would as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah very Australian. <laughs> um, this is the book that got me sober. It was like words literally flipped a switch. Yes. Thank you, William. So there was a lot of those that we we could shower you with glorification for hours on end, but that would be boring, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, Do you hear a lot of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's all positive. Mean, I I kind of originally because on Amazon there's now loads and loads of reviews for it and they're all like fairly positive but I was for ages thinking to myself yeah but when something's good people tend to shout about it but when it's rubbish you just tend to not say anything about it but yeah I I think there's been enough enough positive feedback now that I can relax in the knowledge that it does seem to be helping people yeah Yeah, that's good you're the modern day Alan Carr really aren't you yes you are a bit well, Alan, yeah, to be honest, Alan Carr paved the way for me completely. Well, when I kind of tell my story, I always start at, you know, I was like, I think I started drinking and smoking at sort of 14. Um, and I came across Alan Carr's quit smoking book when I was 16 or 17. And it really struck a chord with me. And I ended up reading virtually everything he's ever written. Mm. Um, and it, it very much set the scene for me. So, yeah, absolutely. Alan Carr was, as I say, certainly paved the way for me. 
Yeah, I, I remember reading that when I was about 18 and the monkey, feeding the monkey the banana. I remember that, yes, like I always that. feeding the addiction. Yeah, it's for, for resonated mm. with me at a young age. It didn't stop me smoking, of course, because <laughs> nothing was going to stop, stop me you. doing anything because I was <laughs> a mental, mental case. Um, so I'm just going to go over quickly, William, what we're, what we're going to do today. So today we want to delve into the life, a day in the life of a drinker. Um, we want okay. to understand the science behind each step in our decision making and learn how sometimes our actions are not always actually our fault it's just what us humans are kind of programmed to do um Mm -hmm. and we always like our listeners to know what they're going to get get from listening to this podcast so we want them to leave with a new sense of awareness around alcohol and how it affects your brain your behavior and perhaps we want our listeners to forgive themselves for the times they've done ridiculous things like nudie runs at the church fate and things like (laughs) how did you know about that lucy (laughs) oh well i didn't i just assumed (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I have done a few nudie runs in my time. I know. I think you've done them sober from memory. Yes, as well. I do do yes. them occasionally sober. Like, my, actually, I'll just tell you very quickly. My neighbour is from Denmark. Luckily, but there's a little gap between my front door and our pool. Obviously, we have pools in Australia. We're very lucky, William. Um, mm. And there's a little space where I think he sees me run from my house <laughs> to my pool on a daily basis. <laughs> I almost went round there with just a photo and went, "This is the body of a middle-aged woman. Accept it." He's probably li- he probably waits all day. At the yeah, he's got his little binoculars. <laughs> you should That's hang out with him actually true. quite yeah. well. <laughs> he's got a little cupboard with you in, Lucy. <laughs> oh, stop all this. She's always sorry. Really I've always tried to you. make Lucy into some sort of devil, don't I? <laughs> sorry, it's Lucy. not that hard. Sorry. Um, look, but before we start, William, can you just tell us a little bit about your drinking? Um, why, like, what it was like? Why you stopped? And ultimately, why you actually wrote such a useful book about it? Yeah, so so I, I as I mentioned, I, I started drinking and smoking at fourteen, um, and it was very much sort of binge drinking. That's what we did. We got into, I, 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 you know, could probably talk for hours on the reasons behind it, but it's I think mainly cultural. Um, and but the whole point was the weekend would come and you would go out and get drunk. You wouldn't go out and have one or two drinks or so. You know, the the goal of the evening was to go out and get drunk. Um, So that's kind of what started it off. And I don't think it's an uncommon thing, particularly in, you know, like Australia, UK, America. It seems to be kind of what we do. And it's almost seen as like the reward for your hard work during the week is Mm, to then get absolutely hammered at Mm. the week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, So I was always a binge drinker. I never drank daily. um, Except when I had the opportunity to. So, so most of the time, being a lawyer, one of the things was I, I had to use my brain to do my job, and I couldn't do that when I was hungover. Um, so, what I would do is drink lots at the weekend, but then sober up and then going to work. But what I found were the binges were getting more and more extreme, as happens with everyone, the intake tends to increase. Um, and so it was kind of going more and more off the rails at the weekends in that, you know, I'd start drinking Friday lunchtime and then sneak out of work in the afternoon and have another couple and then drink through the evening. Then I think one of the big changes for me was having children as well, because when you don't have children, you can wake up really hung over on a Saturday and just kind of slob around all day until you start to feel a bit better and then start drinking again. But when you've got young children, you don't have that luxury you have to get up and start moving around yeah for me it was very similar yeah it was you have a you have a consequence for the first time don't you a consequence yeah exactly yeah Yeah. but but my way of dealing with that was not to drink less but to start drinking in the mornings because I found then I would that would (laughs) would, like pick me up enough to be able to start like get through the day yeah so so my weekend binge drinking like ended up literally in just constant drinking so it was mm. becoming more and more extreme. And I think the other thing when you have kids is you don't get enough sleep. So you never quite recover. So it was it, it was kind of going more and more off the rails. Yes, yeah, so I um, remember on the Sober Dave podcast, you saying that one of the – one of the real changes was when you were on a train. Me and Lucy were chatting about it just a minute ago. You were on a train and you had a can of special brew on the <laughs> on the way to work. 
Is that right? <laughs> well, it was actually K cider, but oh, oh yeah, yes, because that's I yeah, gave you the, yeah. I gave the wrong information. I think Alan was like looking was, was like, oh really? He yeah. would go, Really? Wow, he's what a legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan's like yeah. legend. I said he was yeah. on the you were on the tube on the way to work in your suit with that. I thought it was a special brew. Oh, it sounds better if it's a special brew. Yeah. Can you it wasn't it the barley wine. It better, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, I hadn't I hadn't sunk that lay. It, yeah, because special brew is nine percent. This this was a mere eight oh, percent cider, so oh. that was a oh, my God. Gosh, yeah, that's fine. So, then. A mere yeah, eight yeah. percent. Um, uh, Lucy and I's uh, drinking is a very, very similar story to yours. I think Lucy, isn't it? Yes. It's like we're binge drinkers. We were party girls. We grew up as teenagers drinking for confidence, and very, very similar style of you know being passed out in farmers' fields, going cow tipping. <laughs> Did you ever go cow tipping? <laughs> never. Yeah, you go and push no, cows never. over when they're asleep. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do it personally. <laughs> yeah, <often. right. laughs> yeah. So we really resonate with your story because it is a type of progressive drinking that um, all of us have experienced to some extent it's changed over our lifetimes and and it's, it's been very under the radar sort of drinking like we call it the gray area drinking I call it my pinot gris purgatory where we sort of fell through the cracks but yeah mm. very your story definitely resonates with us our idea for the podcast today is to break down sort of 24 hours in the life of a drinker and, and what happens to the brain Lucy and I are really fascinated in that so we're going to go through 10 points of the things me and Lucy came up with 10 points that we we really want the answers to for personal reasons yeah. as well for our <laughs> listeners. Um, we want to find out why we kept repeating these crazy behaviours, you know, from the first craving all the way to the hangover. So I'll let Lucy start with the first question for you, William. Yeah, OK. okay. Are you ready to go, William? Oh, I don't know about that. But... Fire these questions <laughs> at go. you. <laughs> Just make it up quick if you don't know yeah. the answer. Yeah, don't yeah quick fire round. Um, okay, the first thing um, that comes to mind when you think about those drinking sessions um, is the thought of drinking because we start thinking about drinking hours, um, sometimes even days before we pick up that first drink. And just knowing that you're going to have a drink um, is a wonderful feeling for a heavy drinker. Um, but also there's that shall I, shan't I, that thinking about drinking and what you call it in your book, the cravings. Tell mm -hmm. us about, about that period leading up uh, um, to having that drink and why our brain is already going crazy at the thought of it so yeah so <clears throat> cravings are quite an interesting thing um, and when people talk about cravings they, they quite often talk about them like they're something you can't control like they you know like a bolt of lightning coming out of the sky and hitting you it's it's kind of external yes. to you you <laughs> suffer yeah. it and you don't suffer it gosh that's so true of course it, it, it isn't that at all. It's a conscious thought process you go through. Um, and how it usually starts is you start thinking about having an alcoholic drink. Um, and then you essentially start doing two things. You start obsessing about it and you start fantasizing about it. Um, and that's when you, you exactly as you say, you sit there kind of thinking how wonderful it will be to have that drink. Um, and what you're really doing is just torturing yourself over it. You're sat there thinking about how lovely that glass of Pinot Grigio or that ice cold beer or whatever it is will taste and feel when you drink it but the problem with that is say for example you're not drinking for any reason you suddenly can't concentrate or enjoy what you're doing because you're thinking about drinking now a, a kind of a common one and this is often happens when people stop is they find that and this is what you hear a lot I can't relax in the evening you know how do you mm. relax without a drink but actually, the dynamic isn't that alcohol is helping you because what's happening, you know, take a typical evening. You I don't know that many people come home from the office anymore, bearing in mind lockdown. But, you know, you finish work for the day. It's been a stressful day. You sit down, you have a meal, you put the TV on. Now, having a meal and sitting down and watching TV and taking your mind off work is inherently pleasurable. But if you're sat there thinking about alcohol and how much you want to drink and how you're not particularly happy because you can't have one then you're not thinking about enjoying the meal you're not concentrating on what's t what's on tv what you're actually doing is going through an unpleasant kind of almost internal tantrum because mm -hmm. you want something you can't have um, and that really is what a craving is it's that sort of torturing yourself with the thought of something now, the problem is then if you have whatever it is you want that you can't have so in this situation, alcohol, as soon as you have it, you remove that unpleasant mental conundrum 
and you can then sit and actually mm. concentrate on your meal and concentrate on what's going on on the TV. And if you get embroiled in the storyline, of course, it takes your mind off what was happening at work. So alcohol right. hasn't actually helped. All no. it's done is ca- cause this conundrum that's stopping you from relaxing. And then by having it, it's then removed it, if Gosh, that makes sense. Yeah, it's almost it like really you're does. tricking yourself, aren't you? Well, you're, you're, you're creating it yourself. Yeah, you're totally. creating your own monster in your head. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and then you're and then you're sort of um, sedating that monster with a, a drink. Yeah. But you created it in the first place. It's just a. It's just a. Like you say, it's a fantasy. Yeah, it's a total Completely illusion, fantasy. isn't it? I mean, we do it to mm. ourselves, and it's almost like we know we're doing it sort of deep down on a subconscious level. We know that we're creating it because we want to relieve it. That's the reason why we're creating it, because we want to drink, because yes. that's what we're addicted to doing. So mm. we create that monster for ourselves, yeah. Then then if we do choose to have that first drink, William, number question number two we're going into, mm-hmm. Um why does it feel so amazing? I, I mean, I know we're relieving some chemicals there. There's going to be hormones involved. Like, what is going on in our bodies when we take yeah. a sip of that if first I, drink? And if I can just interrupt before you answer, I've never done heroin, but obviously I've watched on TV as people shoot up with heroin and you mm-hmm. can kind of get that that sense of, uh, of absolute pleasure that they're getting. I liken that to what it used to be like for me having that first sip of drink it was just so incredibly pleasurable even though the alcohol hasn't hit your yeah. system of course because it takes probably 20 minutes for anything to be really, really enter into your bloodstream and have any side yeah. effects from it but, but just yet, one sip makes yeah, us feel incredible yeah. why is that so that there's a few points there there's there's some physiological points and some psychological points i've already touched on the you know that craving that fantasizing so firstly when you're actually drinking you're getting rid of that what I refer to as like an unpleasant mental tantrum that you're going through. But there's also a few physiological sides to it because alcohol is is a chemical depressant. It's a sedative. So it's something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. And that's why we tend to feel more relaxed after a drink. Um, but where the real problem comes in is your brain has its own store of drugs, hormones and chemicals um, and it releases them at il- exactly the right times and exactly the right quantities to keep you feeling, you know, positive and awake and well. Um, you know, things you would have heard about like adrenaline and endorphins and cortisone, mm. all these different things. And it, it helps to think of it as just this massive chemical balance. It's called homeostasis, but it's like a, a delicate chemical balance that your brain works to maintain. So when you take something like alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain reacts to it and what it does it tries to become hypersensitive so that it can work under the sedating effects of the alcohol Um, and there's lots and lots of different ways it does this there's different chemicals it releases adrenaline to sort of to, to, to wake you up and feel more stimulated but the problem is then when the alcohol wears off that overstimulation remains um Now, if you're regularly drinking, one of the biggest pleasures in having a drink is actually just relieving that unpleasant feeling that's been left over from the last drink. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, your your brain's set up and it's working absolutely fine, but then you introduce this sedative, so it becomes hypersensitive, um, and then the alcohol wears off, the sedative wears off, and that that hypersensitivity remains afterwards. And during that period, you know, if you've just had one small glass of wine, that feeling will be almost imperceptible. You'll just feel slightly out of sorts and, you know, maybe slightly more anxious than you usually would. But then if you're talking about a bottle, two bottles of wine, whatever, that's when it manifests itself in like actual anxiety. You feel quite unpleasant. And that's where that term anxiety comes in, that anxiety you get when you're hung over. It's actually got a chemical basis for it. Um, so when there's two ways you can get rid of that unpleasant feeling. One is just to wait a few days because eventually your brain then goes back to normal. But a far quicker way of getting rid of that unpleasant feeling is to take another drink because the reason you feel unpleasant is because your brain's geared to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol, but there's no alcohol there. So if you introduce a bit of alcohol, you immediately go back to feeling more relaxed. Um, And that's the big pleasure for regular drinkers. You know, that morning, uh, morning, um, that first (laughs) glass of wine of the day when they sit down after a hard day at work or whatever, that wonderful feeling of relaxation 
is no more than just correcting a chemical imbalance that was caused by alcohol through, in the first through the place. Through the drink, yeah. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I remember, I remember in your book you mentioned the wedding scenario, and for yes. me that was like yeah. the bit that I was just like, God, this is me. I remember like that exact moment where you mm. have that first drink and you feel like, yeah, especially if it's a weekend away and you're on that Friday night and you know that you've got a drink all weekend – and you do feel that feeling of euphoria having that first drink and like this is going to be fun. But then the next day when oh, you've got yeah. that hangover, you've got to drink again. Everyone's there with you. It's not the same drink, but you do it to get rid of the anxiety caused by the alcohol. And I remember I was the same throughout my life, even if I didn't drink like on a, you know, like a focused basis, like a wedding, it would be sort of that process drawn out a little bit further. So I'd drink on a Friday, binge drink, I'd be hung over till Sunday, then mm. I'd had anxiety monday mm. tuesday wednesday by the thursday i was waving a tenor at a barman so mm. it was like a more drawn out process that got shorter and shorter throughout my life until the point i had anxiety every day to and i had to drink to get rid of it so it, it's really a progressive disease like that isn't it you know it's very interesting yeah, yeah absolutely and of course the, one of the big things is of course the brain becomes more and more proficient <laughs> at countering the alcohol so you yeah. can drink more and more um, and the results of that is you need more to get the same effect um, and secondly, that's what tolerance is. That's why we can drink more now than we did when we first started drinking. It's because our brain's becoming increasingly proficient. But of course, mm. the more we drink, the worse the withdrawal is. And a lot of people kind of struggle with the concept that, you know, even so-called normal drinkers or grey area drinkers suffer from alcohol withdrawal. Because when you think of alcohol withdrawal, you know, you think of the Hollywood, you know, people shaking and seeing insects climbing the walls and all the rest of it but the fact of the matter is a withdrawal is just an unpleasant feeling that mm. is caused by a chemical imbalance that is itself caused by the previous dose of the drug um, yeah. and that is experienced by everyone who has ever drunk an alcoholic drink but yeah. of course yeah. you know if you're a very light drinker as I say that feeling is almost imperceptible but it is there that's actually interesting because that leads on to the third one that we've got because I was just thinking that we've kind of already talked about it because my question is not when you we're talking about once you've had one or two drinks here not when you're absolutely off your rocker mm. um, but once you've had one or two drinks some people are able to get up and go home have dinner watch a bit of tv and go to bed people like Vic and I probably yourself, William, we had yep. to stay in the pub or we'd go home, but with a bottle of wine. You know, yep. why is it that some people um, are unable to stop at one or two? I mean, you've probably explained it to us quite a bit in that, you know, and that's in, in, an amazing thing that you've just been talking about. It's probably the bit that I took from the book, the best bit, the fact that it makes us anxious and that's why we have another drink. But how, mm. some, how come some people don't get that feeling of anxiety and they can just have one or two why can't who we are moderate they? who are, yeah. they, those who are these? I hate them all who can moderate Ooh. and why can they do it and we the can't <laughs> so yeah where are these three or four people left over? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so not here what it is, so if you if you think of just keep in mind at the moment so every drink causes an unpleasant feeling when it wears off but the more you drink the more pronounced that feeling is OK. Right. Um, and also when you first. So, so if you take someone who's never drunk before and you give them a glass of wine, they'll feel slightly dulled and slightly out of sorts. And when it wears off, it will leave a very slight anxious feeling, but they won't really be consciously aware of it. They just won't feel quite right. OK. And then a couple of hours after that, they'll kind of be back to normal. And that's the sum total of it. So when you're in that phase, you can have one or two and it never dawns on you to take another one. But as you drink over the years where you might have a drink and then, you know, break for half an hour and then go back to it, your subconscious starts to learn a valuable lesson. And what it learns is when an alcoholic drink wears off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling and another alcoholic drink will get rid of that feeling. Now, it takes time and it takes repeated drinking to get to that point. But when you are at the point where your well, it's usually your subconscious, but also your conscious mind knows that that unpleasant feeling kicks in and it needs another drink to relieve it, it just interprets that feeling as, as I want another drink. So it's learned behavior. So 
when we talk about people, you know, these mytholo- mythological people who supposedly can just have one or two, and yes, they are out there, all it means is they haven't yet become addicted to alcohol. Every drug has its take it or leave it phase. You know, even things you think of as horrendously addictive, like heroin and, and even smoking. Smoking's very addictive, but a lot of people might you know when you start off you start just smoking at weekends or when you're out with friends and it takes a while to build up but all it is is you starting to learn on a subconscious level that when the withdrawal kicks in you need another dose of the drug to get rid of it now that's one of the problems with drinking is when you get to that stage you can't backtrack and this is one of the things with every drug that i think people need to be aware of that take it or leave it stage is a one and one only stage because when you experience that feeling of withdrawal and your brain interprets it as I want another drink or cigarette or whatever that might be, you can never unlearn that. That's with you for life. So I've stopped drinking now for seven and a half years. Say Mm -hmm. if I stopped for 40 years, if I then had a drink it would wear off and it would leave an unpleasant feeling. And my brain would say, oh, I remember that feeling. And I also remember how to get rid of it, have another drink. So I can never be back to the situation I was when I started drinking, where my brain would just think, oh, I don't feel right. There's nothing I can do about it or just wouldn't even notice it. Yeah, because you've learned it, like your body has learnt what it wants. Yeah, you can't unlearn it. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So once we've had those, you know, those first couple, like me and Lucy call it the moderation pixie, don't we? We're, mm. Where there was a little pixie on our shoulder that used to, <laughs> used to annoy one. us. Yes, have another one, Vicky. And yeah, I would yeah. lean in throughout the night. Like, I'd hate the pixie at the beginning of the evening, but but then I would be leaning into what the naughty pixie had to say. And both me and Lucy were doing the conga with the pixie by the end of the night, weren't we? Yeah, so best mates. We best would, mates with the pixie. Yeah, we love the pixie yeah. in the end, but we hate the pixie now, don't we, Lucy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that pixie is not part of our lives. But when we were drinking, drink, alcohol had all sorts of different effects on us, you know, on our speech, on our how we walked, how we talked, everything. It affected us in a physical way, both of us. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't behave normally. What's happening to our bodies there, William, when we're not behaving in a normal way and we can't walk properly or talk properly? What is yeah. actually happening? Yeah, not so much when we're going totally mad, just the fact that we can't string a sentence together yeah. or walk in a straight line. It's amazing. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so it is a sedative and it sedates. And the more you drink of it, the more sedated you become. So your body just, as you say, you just stop being able to to operate normally. And that's where you come in with the slurred speech and sort of falling over. It's just you're too heavily sedated. You know, if you think as well, if, you know, someone was, I don't know, given a very powerful anaesthetic, they wouldn't be able to talk or move properly. That's essentially what you're doing with alcohol. There's there's kind of a knock on with that as well. We start acting very differently because one of the things alcohol does is it inhibits it has a it has a pronounced intoxicative effect on a part of our brain that regulates emotion. So what you normally find is emotions, very interestingly, that they're, they're fired off and then parts of your brain jump in to dampen them down, to calm things down if they're not required. So mm. I think I give the example in the book, you know, if you knock over a coffee, coffee cup or something and it smashes everywhere, you get really annoyed, but you get over it fairly quickly because your brain jumps in and sort of calms everything down. Now, when you're drinking, that part of your brain that jumps in to calm things down becomes sedated very quickly, so you're unable to regulate emotion. So when you're drinking, not only are you slurring and falling over, you also become very highly emotional, um, emotive. People become really over emotional. Mm. Um, and that's why you have this you know, stereotypical thing of people being drunk and crying their eyes out or messaging exes or you know, mm. whatever it might be. We tend to become very overly emotional. Um, and again, it's just the effects of the drug building up over time. Mm. Gosh, it's amazing. Mm, I, I I know. I mean, I've never ever texted an ex when I've been Have drunk. You? <laughs> Lies. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't know you when you were drinking. I, I was always really good with that. I, I I worked out at a really early time that a mobile phone and drinking would just 
an absolute recipe for disaster. So I would always put my phone to one side when I was drinking. So people would have like extended silent periods from me. But I never <laughs> went through that thing of sending these awful texts or social media oh. messages or anything. So well, yes, I'm and I think we were actually that. we were talking on our last podcast about the fact that we were so grateful that we didn't have social media when we were in our really heavy drinking years. Oh God, yeah. Oh yeah. God, Awful, because yeah, I mean, it's bad enough having the phone but you were very clever to realize we never yeah. realized that did we Vic I mean a, a mobile phone in our hands when we were drinking was, was, was a complete anything. disaster yeah, yeah I was no, a dis- but I was also a dis- again it was a few years ago before social media was quite as big as it was now so mm, it, well, yeah. I can't take all the credit for it but no I, no. I can't imagine that wake it's bad oh. enough waking up thinking where's my wallet where's my keys what <laughs> yeah. happened last night <laughs> Without really having a whole world of social media posts going on till three in the morning or something. Oh, oh dear. Funnily, weirdly enough, I know you lived in Brighton, didn't you, William? Do you go to uni in Brighton? No, my sister was down there at university. Oh, yes, that's so right. I went you down and visited down her loads. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so I, w- I lived in Brighton. I had a pager when I lived in Brighton. Oh, Do you remember pagers? <laughs> yeah. I was like a drug, dodgy drug dealer. I, I used was- to like. <laughs> Phone up someone for speed to buy some speed or something, buy some drugs. On your page, on my page. I don't know how cool that is. It's not cool. I'm not saying it's cool. It was very, very sad, but I thought it was cool. But I also thought riding a BMX around when I was 20 was cool as well. Down the Big Beat Boutique. You know, I thought I was extra cool, but actually I was just a bit of a dog. No. <laughs> With my no, page. Vic, no. <laughs> anyway, bright days. Can't okay, so much. talking about ordering speed off of a pager. <laughs> Tell us, William, <laughs> why don't we have a stop button? <laughs> that's my next question to you. So, so <laughs> that's essentially, that comes back to what I was mentioning before. So every time you have a drink, it wears off and it leaves a slightly unpleasant feeling. Now, eventually you get to the point where your brain realises that the quickest way to get that get rid of that feeling is to have another drink. So when you're at that point, every drink creates a desire for the next one. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and that's why you just keep going and going and going, and and the end of the road really for that is you just keep drinking and drinking and drinking until you're so heavily sedated you just drop unconscious. Right, um, well, but that's really what it is. Mm-hmm. Every single dose creates the need for the next one, um, and that's a thing I think people don't really appreciate. They almost think of alcohol like food where you know if you're hungry and you eat enough of something you don't want any more of it but that never ever works with alcohol because no matter what you how much you have of it it will always wear off leaving an unpleasant feeling and your brain interprets that feeling as I want another drink um so it's part and parcel really of the same process yeah, it's it just, leads on to our next question, yeah, actually. It it's about not feeling physical pain or emotional pain. Me and Lucy did our last podcast on the topic risk and how mm. we felt invincible throughout our lives. I mean, there are some stories on there which would hurt to, uh, you know, anyone's ears. They were terrible. One one of them being Lucy being hit by a car, in fact, <laughs> which, which, just, yeah. which, which she, she shared with me on that podcast where she rolled over and landed on all fours like a we did like laugh, a cat. Though, yeah, but I mean, some of those stories that, I mean, William, I'm, I'm, I've got one finger short because I blew one <laughs> yeah. of my fingers off with a firework on the Millennium Night. Oh, so like me. a lot of... We've got a lot of crazy stories where we put ourselves at risk pretty much every weekend, didn't we, Lucy? We yeah. were quite just in... the weekend, sometimes in the week, sometimes during the week, sometimes on a Monday, yeah. sometimes yeah. on a Monday days. morning. Um, Monday morning yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on a Monday morning, yeah. We would have been there with you with a can of red stripe, wouldn't yeah, we, on the tube into London? On the train into London, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> would have been a good laugh. Uh, until the hangover. And... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Blowing up fingers. Yeah. I, might, I might jump in front of the train just to really make everyone laugh. Yeah, hey, look at me. Woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the sort of thing we did but what why we, do what, we do that? I don't know <laughs> exactly so when we we have we're obviously you've said about us being in a sort of emotional state but what's going on with our physical state like how do we not feel pain in those moments yeah so it, it's an anesthetic essentially so this is why you know a few hundred years ago they used to give them a bottle of rum to drink before they you know soldiers and sailors who'd had injured mm. limbs before they saw that saw their limb, their legs or arms off or whatever it is it is yeah. an anesthetic so take enough of it and you start to feel less and less. And I think that's as true for 
emotional side as it yeah. is for the physical side. Yeah, you're just numbing everything out. It's just it's just inebriating you to the point where you can't feel or hear or, you know, it's numbing everything, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the reasons I think, and, and again, I sort of mentioned briefly about how one of the big pleasures for, drink, for when you're drinking is alleviating the you know the unpleasantness caused by the previous drinks but of course that's not true all the time and particularly you know having spoken myself about being a binge drinker that wasn't the case for me on a Friday because I'd done two or three days not drinking so mm-hmm. that had gone and yet it still felt very nice to have a drink partly because of the craving thing um, but secondly because when you're socializing So when we humans socialize, our brains release endorphins. So it makes you feel really good. And that's why, you know, when you see kids at kids parties, they're going absolutely berserk. It's almost like they've been drinking anyway. It's the endorphins flying around. But when you grow up a bit, you start to care more and more what people think of you. So when you go out to a social occasion, you're slightly nervous and the endorphins don't get released until you're, you know, you're relaxed and you settle into it. So for example, now when I don't drink, I go to a social occasion, I feel a bit nervous, a bit unpleasant. But as I sort of relax into it, I kind of relax and start to enjoy myself. But actually, there's a quicker way of doing it. Because if you take an anesthetic, it will mm-hmm. anesthetize those feeling of nerves um, and then let the endorphins run. Um, and that's a lot of the time what people think of as a great high of drinking isn't, isn't actually a drinking high at all. It's an endorphin high. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very different situation. Again, I think it's kind of indicative of how, when you start to understand alcohol, it becomes less and less attractive. Mm. Yeah. You see it for what it is. It's interesting because we're Mm. going through all of these questions and really they all, all the answers are very, they're actually very similar. It's quite a simple process, isn't it? What alcohol is doing to us. It's just doing it on different levels. And the longer we've done it for, the the more clever our brain gets at working with it. So we're just doing it in a worse and worse manner as time goes by. Yeah. And um, I mean, that really, awful thing that comes with drinking which I I shudder and I I go into a hot sweat when I think about it it's a blackout Mm. Uh, that oh my god you know even the thought of how many blackouts I've had in my life and uh, you know how we can behave in such a way so different from the people that we usually are um, and yet we don't have any recollection of it whatsoever how on earth can that happen to us William what is it that happens in our brains that can mean that we black out completely but carry on functioning as a completely different person yeah it's strange isn't it so so this is all theoretical but the current thinking of with with memories is that um, you've got two different types of memory. You've got short term memory and you've got long term memory. And what happens is short term memory is usually people think it lasts, you know, three to five minutes or a bit longer, depending. Um, but for, if you think about having a conversation with people on a day to day level, you may have many, many conversations with people during the course of a day and you need to have a memory span of, you know, a few minutes because otherwise you wouldn't make any sense in this conversation. But of course, you're not going to remember each and every one of these conversations 10 years down the line. So what the theory is, is everything that happens passes into your short term memory, but then only selected memories then pass into your long term memory. Mm -hmm. Now, what is believed is that alcohol stops memories going from short term to long term which causes this really strange situation where you do get people who are you know absolutely hammered and that's why they don't remember anything but a lot of the time you can have people who are seemingly fairly compassmentous and not that intoxicated but they have no memory of what they were doing the following Mm. day Um, and the reason for that is they're functioning fine but none of those memories are passing into their long-term memory. It's all short-term because of the alcohol mm. is stopping it from going into long-term memory. So they can be bouncing around the whole day absolutely fine, um, but it's just then not passed on to their long-term memory. So you then have no memory of it the following day. Now, if you add into that the fact that when we've been drinking, obviously it being an anesthetic and a, and a sedative, it sedates our inhibition. So we tend to be a lot more outgoing and a lot more confident than we would otherwise be. Whereas when you wake up the next day, you've gone the other way because, you know, the withdrawals kicked in. So you feel really anxious and a bit timid and a bit afraid. 
and and that's where you have this really weird situation because you find out things you did yesterday one of which you have absolute no memory of and two in your ultra sensitive and you know particularly terrified state you can't imagine doing so it's mm. it's like comparing two very different parts of you of which you have no memory of so it can be really unpleasant and disconcerting for people yeah gosh it's very confronting and no wonder we all felt so awful the next day i mean that that fear of the forgotten i guess is what it is well, you always it? assume the worst you always well. assume yeah, you do. the worst that's, you don't know yeah. and it just yeah. yeah and it feels like it's a it's a heavy emotion that to not know oh, what you've it, done it's enough to make you feel suicidal yeah i mean that was really, really what had to yeah led yeah. me to quit drinking was because that anxiety from those blackouts was so severe not mm. knowing what what I had done, and and then having to wake up, mm. you know, with her a crying baby the next day, and oh God, yeah. yeah, like two different yeah. lives being, you know, colliding each Sunday morning. That is, you know, why I never drank again. Like that's how severe it is, yeah. and, and that's mm. for a lot of people, isn't it? You wake up after mm. having a blackout, and it is absolutely humiliating and mortifying, oh. isn't it? Because you hate yourself in those moments. So it just causes more and more angst because you'd hate what you've done. You don't know what you've done. And it's just this whole horrible mixed up feeling of, of panic and dread, isn't it? It really is. And what I found for me, and I don't know about you, William and Vic, but I think in my earlier years of drinking, I would go out and I would kind of be the truth fairy. You know, I'd be that person who all that stuff that the sober me didn't want to say would come tumbling out. Mm. But it was still me. But later on in my drinking days, I'd almost just turn into a totally different person when I was black when I was blacking out and still functioning and talking I would find out that I'd done things that were so different to the mm. real me so completely off my own strong values that I felt when yeah. I was sober I was literally Jack it was a Jekyll and Hyde situation the you know the further I got into my drinking yeah, it's crazy, Lucy, the things that we do in in blackouts. I mean, I'm glad I blacked out, to be honest, because I do oh. not want to know, you know, imagine if there was a switch you could flick and suddenly oh. saw all the things well, you, you know, do someone in someone videos you. That's what they oh, say, don't they? Get dear. someone to video you drunk and you'll never get drunk. That's why I had a pager. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's quite the same, Vic. <laughs> it took too long for people yeah. to tell me what I've been doing. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> So in your book, William, the chapter that, I mean, me and Lucy hate the word resonated, but we keep saying it all the time. <laughs> resonated and journey are just yeah. sober journey. But we still, we still say that. them. Yeah, we still say them. Anyway, the, the bit that I liked <laughs> was was the bit about sleep. I mean, mm. that sleep thing for me when I was drinking, I would wake up in the middle of night with palpitations, feeling awful. Then I'd try to go back to sleep. And then the worst night for me was the day after the hangover. I wouldn't be able to go to sleep because I'd have a fear of not being able to go to sleep and it would just go on and on and yes. on. So what's happened? You know, we've, we've had a hangover. We've had the blackout. Why can't we sleep after drinking, William? That's, that's yeah, this is one of the biggest things for me and when when I kind of got this sorted out in my head I think this was one of the biggest nails in the coffin of my drinking ever mm. because it, it, if we go back to the physiological side of things so you're taking this sedative um, and sedating yourself but when it wears off you're left really hypersensitive um, and that hypersensitive feeling is almost like having too much caffeine. You know, when you drink too much coffee and you mm. start to feel deeply unpleasant, you know, your yeah. brain's kind of racing ahead and you feel all twitched up and you can't relax and it's just not a nice feeling. So what happens is usually about five hours after your last drink, that's when the scales tip um, and that oversensitivity really kicks in. So what people find is um, five hours after their last drink, that's when they wake up. So for most people, that's that three or four in the morning wake up. Someone said to me once, oh, I, I you know, don't know what you're talking about. I never get that. And when I spoke to him a bit further, what he was actually drink, doing was drinking till about one in the morning. Um, and then he'd set the alarm for six. So so the, <laughs> the wake up mm. kind of coincided with him getting up anyway. But this mm. is why you wake up in the middle of the night and you don't wake up feeling relaxed and calm and, you know, lie in bed and slowly drift off back to sleep. You lie there feeling, you know, anxious your heart's hammering, you're worrying about anything and everything, and you may be absolutely exhausted, but you can't sleep. Um, and it's to do with that chemical imbalance. <clears throat> now, um, 
what people don't understand is or maybe don't appreciate enough is that sleep isn't about lying down and going unconscious for eight hours and then getting up and being good to go we go through we humans go through very specific sleep cycles um and there's different types of sleep that we go through and i don't think we need to go into massive amounts of detail but one of the main differentiating factors between the sleep cycles is how deeply unconscious we are so at one end of the scale we've got something called deep sleep which as the name suggests you're really deeply unconscious but on the other end of the scale there's something called rem sleep now rem sleep is when we dream um, and when they've when they've attached sensors to people um, to monitor them in rem sleep their brains light up almost as if they were fully awake so it's this really strange area of sleep we don't know much about it we know we dream through it um when they've done tests with rats when they've starved them of rem sleep it's actually killed them so it's it's a crucial part of our sleep cycle now when you drink alcohol because it's a sedative your brain can't get you into rem sleep most people normal without introducing a drug in normal sleep you'll get six or seven cycles of rem sleep when you drink you typically only get two because your brain can't get you up into that higher level of consciousness that you're needed to go into rem sleep and then of course when the five hours is up you can't sleep at all if you do sleep it's that weird kind of just drifting in and out of sleep and not proper sleep um i quite often liken it to you know imagine if you're prime position is that you get eight hours sleep a night and i don't know say you go to bed at 11 and wake up at seven and that's your eight hours sleep drinking is like setting an alarm for four in the morning every night and getting up Mm. and drinking seven or eight massive mugs of strong black coffee that's what it's doing to your sleep (laughs) cycle um so it's horrendous And, and to be honest that was one of the things i hated most about drinking was that waking up in the middle of the night exhausted but unable to go back to sleep. And I found one of the things I did when I first stopped, I had that image really close to hand so that whenever I was in a situation where someone would offer me a drink or, you know, I was on holiday and I'd look at the bar and think, oh, you know, a cold beer would be nice. The first thing that would jump into my mind is the thought of waking up at three, four in the morning and that, you know, that horrible feeling of anxiety and tiredness mixed together. Mm. Um, yeah, it is, it's, it's absolutely horrendous. And what I think people don't appreciate is, yes, if you're drinking two or three bottles of wine, it's quite extreme, but even one drink will impact your sleeping pattern. So these so-called no, normal drinkers that we were talking about, mm. the people who can supposedly take it or leave it and they just have one or two, they're still not escaping the ill effects because this is the other thing. People think if you drink little <clears throat> enough, you get all the good and none of the bad. But of course, that's mm. not the case at all. Yeah, so a build-up of sleep deprivation eventually is going to cause you to probably reach for a drink more. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It causes all kinds of issues. Um, and, and and I caveat this heavily now because this isn't true for everyone, but I know a number of people who have been on medication for depression and general mental health things, um, and when they've quit drinking – they've been able to just come off it. You know, the anxiety disappears. Mm. A lot of anxiety is caused by the drinking. You know, as I've touched on, when the alcohol wears off, it leaves you feeling anxious. But I think the impact on your mental health on constantly ruining your sleep can't be underestimated. Mm. No, definitely not. It's a really big thing for me as well, sleep. And in fact, I think our next podcast, we're going to do it on triggers. So the things that really, because, you know, it's traumatic trying to give up alcohol for so many years and for drinking Mm. for so long that when you do do give up, you're still triggered um, by things. And one thing for me is if I feel really tired, if I haven't had a good night's sleep for any reason, even now when I'm sober, if I feel tired, I immediately feel like anxious because it reminds me of drink my drinking days it's Mm. linked so closely to my drinking days because sleep 
like you, William, my sleep and the way it was wrecked was causing havoc on my life. Um, and like you say as well, I, I am one of those people who was on a quite strong medication for um, depression while I was drinking mm. a year on. And um, I, I literally have nothing at all now. It was the alcohol and the way that it was causing um, my life to go into a massive downward spiral and my lack of sleep mm. that was causing the problem. Yeah. Mm. And it's the same for me. Like I get triggered if I'm tired now, it reminds me of being hungover. Yeah. And as soon as I think about being hungover, feel... I think about anxiety yeah. and I think I'm having a panic attack. So actually all I am now is tired because I've got three young kids and like mm. the days are long and I get hardly any sleep. But when I wake up in the morning, it takes me straight back to that me feeling. Too. It takes me, it's like somebody's tapping me in the shoulder from the past and going, you're coming back here with me because yeah. I just suddenly feel huge anxiety when I'm tired and I hate it. And we we call mm -hmm. it a sober hangover Lucy yeah. and I sometimes like it's we have hangovers from being big drinkers that just we can't seem to shake I'm sure you're a bit further along the line than us Lucy's nearly a year sober yeah. next week and yeah. I'm nearly four years sober in March um, wow, and okay. I do think that uh, things will change for us at, at different stages but for me there are still things repercussions that are hanging over from those days and for Lucy as well do you find you still have a few uh things that are laying over from from your drinking days like that yeah, so so funny enough, and, and you kind of think like giving up drinking, and you know when you start doing it, you think it's this horrible penance that you have to go through, and then you start to realise all the benefits to it. And I think then then I got to the stage of thinking, getting into the mindset. Well, you know what? I, I genuinely don't want this substance anymore. I'm so much mm -hmm. better off without it. But it's almost like I kind of think of it as the gift that keeps giving because even yeah. the other day it was. I can't remember what it was. So so my two boys had just gone back to school on Thursday. So they're back at school after the summer holidays, Thursday, Friday, and they went straight into a school trip overnight. So this is the first time in a decade that my wife and I have got a night to ourselves. So we, we booked and went to this spa. Um, and it was quite nice weather. So people were sat outside by the pool. Um, and I was kind of watching people drinking because a lot of people, it's almost like being on holiday. So they go there and they're drinking. I'm sort of looking at them and you start to th see things in a different way. And I think even now I'm still seeing things slightly differently and I'm still going through changes because I was kind of watching them and thinking, I, I just wouldn't want to be doing what you're doing because mm. you can kind of see them getting up and sitting down and they just look exhausted you know <laughs> that kind of yeah. you can tell when someone's been drinking the night before and they, they obviously sat there waiting for the bar to open and the bar opens and they start the drinks going but mm -hmm. we have this image of people like chatting and laughing and it all being good fun but of course it isn't because you're sort of watching them and they just look exhausted yeah. for the whole day sort of putting these drinks away and also they're but, so preoccupied with it that in those moments like they're preoccupied with the next drink and me and Lucy mm. talk about that a lot our total preoccupation mm. with alcohol when we were drinking so you were sat there with your wife probably just enjoying the sunset and looking at the trees and you know me and Lucy have been, really connect with nature a lot more yeah. now don't we like yeah. we notice things like yeah. <laughs> natural things more than we ever did because we were always concentrating on the bar um, so I do think you definitely learn to enjoy the simple things things rather than having that preoccupation when what time's the bar open when when we're we going to get our next drink you know I don't miss that like that when you're in those moments and you see those people like going on a, about their drinking like that it does I do feel a sense of relief of of not being involved in that anymore you definitely see it for what it is mm, but, definitely but, but, yeah before before we get into all the Wonderful Positive, yes. things about <laughs> about um, being sober, and I'm sure that us three could probably go on and on for hours about it. I just want to take us back a bit because we've talked about the horrendousness of sleep um, when we've been drinking. Um, so can can we just talk about the hangover, the, the thing that happens after that monumentally shit night of sleep, <laughs> <laughs> the next delight? Yeah. yeah. So I mean that. One, one of the, well, funny enough, the biggest reported symptom of a hangover is tiredness. And that is, you know, to, entirely to do with the sleep deprivation. Um, the other big thing, of course, is the anxiety. Now, a lot of people believe that's because of the stupid things you do when you're drinking. And that's no doubt plays into it. But actually, the biggest part of that is that oversensitivity, that withdrawal that's sat there the next day feeling unpleasant. Um, but what happens where you, 
your body processes alcohol by turning it into a chemical that I will try and pronounce. I always get it wrong, but I think it's a kelta a keldehyde. But it turns it into this a keldehyde, and and that in, is a poison. It's poisonous. Um, and it builds up over time. Um, and that's one of the reasons you feel very sick the next day. And this is one of the things that kind of irritates me when, and, and you see a few more of them recently, where there's sort of these drinks that you supposedly, soft drinks, but you drink them before you start drinking alcohol and it supp- supp- supposedly assists your hangover, which is a, a chemical impossibility because the reason you're sick when you're drinking um, is because your body has to metabolize alcohol into this chemical, which is then poisonous for you. And that's why you feel sick. Um, so yeah, so that's it. That, that, that pretty much is the hangover. And I said to say the two main parts of the hangover, people often think of it as, you know, the headaches, which is caused by the dehydration, um, but also the sickness. But for most people, I mean, I never really got sick and headaches with hangovers. All I got was tiredness. Um, and what I then identified much later down the line as that kind of that anxious feeling, that anxiety. Yeah. So there is no cure for the hangover. You've got all that poison. Yeah, don't don't drink drink sobriety. It's awful. Think you've all that poison inside. I mean, and also, I've seen people in America in LA and stuff. Now they go on these drips the next day, don't they? Like they have a saline drip to hydrate to hydrate themselves. But obviously, that's not going to work either, is it? No. So, so dehydration is an interesting one because obviously. People kind of, and my friend used to do this. We'd be going home from the pub and he used to buy like an orange juice or some water or something to rehydrate himself. But dehydration, it's, it's your body's, your your body starts to not be able to know how much spare liquid it's got. So we all have, you know, I forget what it is, but we're like 80% water or whatever. Now you, you, you use water. Okay. You use it for sweating. Your body uses it to cool you down. So it has water supplies kept there ready now one of the reasons you know when it gets cold and you need the toilet even if you haven't drunk anything it's because when it's cold your body realizes that you're unlikely to need a lot of water for sweating so it gets rid of some and so you urinate it out um what alcohol does is it basically messes up your body's sensor so that your body thinks it has more liquid in reserves than it actually has now drinking so so if you have a load of alcohol so that that sensor's messed up and it thinks it's got i don't know two pints where it's actually got virtually nothing having a load of liquid isn't going to do you any good at all because your body is still working on the basis that it's got enough liquid so if you've drunk a load of alcohol and then you knock back a bottle of mineral water just before you go to bed it's not going to rehydrate you all it's going to do is make you wake up and need the toilet Gosh, imagine all those people well, all over the world well, having well, pints I of mean, water. <laughs> and, and you know, you say, I'll have a drink a drink of wine, a drink of water. Not that I was ever yeah. any good at that. I think I managed no. to have the wine, the water, the wine, 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 wine. Yeah. You know, you used to alternate with water. So that was a complete, that was a waste of time. Actually, someone's yeah, yeah. contacted me this week to advertise a cup that has, you put wine in the top and you spin it upside down. It has water in the bottom to curb oh. people's drinking. So that's oh. a, a natural product that's out there. Insane, oh, wow. isn't it? It's just, yeah. and actually, so one of the things with this is when you drink any liquid and you urinate it out you don't just urinate out the liquid you also urinate out a small amount of salt now if you drink loads and loads and loads of liquid you can actually it can actually kill you because you're washing through the salt i see so what happens is one of the reasons when you wake up and you're hung over that you want a big cooked breakfast is because there's loads of salt in it so because you're drinking a lot to get the alcohol to get the drug you're washing out salt which gives you salt cravings so actually (laughs) drinking a load of mineral water on top it is on top of it is just making that worse it's almost like an excuse though isn't it yeah yeah it's just yeah it's it's madness but yeah and, and and as i say these things where drink this and you don't get hung over or drink this and it hydrate you. you you cannot hydrate yourself until the chemical effects of the alcohol have worn off and your body realizes "Ooh, i don't have enough water in reserve i need to drink something to get that water level back up and that's why we always want crave savory food as well maybe yeah. after when we've got a hangover just you know mcdonald's or yeah. you know or a pie yeah. or a bit of casserole yeah. it's or salt. something it's like the that salt it's the salt yeah. is it and what about that's william it. quickly while we're on that topic what happens when you go out to l- and you line your stomach beforehand 
So, yeah, so this is another strange one. Um, so alcohol is obviously absorbed into your bloodstream through your, it goes through your stomach and into your small intestine, which is when it's absorbed into the bloodstream. And that's when we feel the effect of it. Now, if you haven't eaten anything or you've just exercised or whatever, then when you have that drink, the alcohol is going to hit your bloodstream that much quicker. So if you line your stomach with something, so you have a big meal, when you're drinking, it will just take longer to go into your bloodstream. So all you're really doing is spreading the effects. I, I, I personally could never see the point of that because for me, the point of drinking was to get the effects of the alcohol. Yeah, exactly. And eating yes. sort of slowed that down. So I could never really see the point of it. Yeah, there was um, that saying, wasn't it? Eating's cheating. That was it. I was trying to think about yeah, eating's yeah. cheating. Yeah. And also you, might... rather interestingly, you, you get a lot of people who are extremely fit who tend to have problems with alcohol mm. more so than others because they're more careful about what they eat, their metabolism's a lot faster. So when they have a drink, it hits their bloodstream that much quicker. So the effect mm. is more pronounced. You know, I was talking about before how that, that effect, when your brain starts to pick on the uh, pick up on the cause and effect, is essentially where you start to learn that one drink, um, that when an alcoholic drink wears off, another drink will get rid of that nasty feeling. People yeah. that tend to be a bit slimmer and, and are quite fit or quite health conscious, that is a more pronounced effect for them. Yes. So when we're feeling like that, after we've had that horrible hangover, we've had no sleep, we've been in a blackout, we've just had a, an average drinker's night out, basically. Yeah. Why then, William, do, <laughs> why do we start again? Why do we drink again? What's going on? So there's a whole raft of things going on there. So firstly, you've got the physiological side. So the anxiety, the tiredness, all of that will be anaesthetized by having another drink. So a substantial amount of, oh, I feel horrible, will actually mm. make you feel a lot better when you have another drink. The other thing being there's sugar in alcohol. The alcoholic drinks we drink tend to be have a lot of sugar in, so you're also getting a sugar boost at the same time. But then if you mix it in with everything else that I've talked about, so if you're used to drinking regularly um, and so, you know, say, you're next, say, say it's a Friday night and you go out on a Saturday night with your friends, you've also got the whole craving thing sat there as well mm. because – you know for a fact when you have a drink you will feel a lot better so then you start to obsess about the drink and so you know when mm. you first turn up you're not really thinking about your friends or anything you what you want to do is get your hands on a drink so when you have that drink you almost free yourself up to enjoy yourself normally because the things yeah. that are stopping you from enjoying yourself is the craving the anxiety the tiredness so having an alcoholic drink will remove all three of those and actually allow you to enjoy the evening Gosh, no wonder it's so ingrained. You know, it sounds mm. like a, obviously you're going to reach for that, aren't you? You're going to lean onto that. I to... mean, even when I was an at-home drinker for a long time, and even if I managed to get through to about six o'clock in the evening with a hangover, feeling terrible all day, and I knew I only had about another four hours to go, but the feeling was so awful that I would have another drink just to get mm. rid of all of those things that you're talking about there, William, because I just couldn't bear another mm. minute of my life feeling that way yeah it was yeah. so awful yeah I remember those were the nights where I would if I was going out two nights in a row I, when I was drinking away a hangover those are the nights that it got really messy because I would yes, drink faster drunk really quickly because yeah. I was so desperate to feel well again mm, I mean that's yeah. crazy isn't it I'm talking about drinking making me feel well but of course I was just accentuating the yeah. problem but, really, but you now. just you what you yeah. just want to feel better don't you just want to feel better which is like as, as you said Lucy like a heroin addiction you know you have the hit to feel well well and in the end mm. you know you, you're not getting that same high you had the first time you took heroin in the end you're having it just to feel normal yeah. um mm. and that's an, a very addictive thing because you get so unwell afterwards so all you're doing is curing yourself really yeah exactly yeah, I'm curing the problem it caused previously and it, it, funny you were mentioning about how you know that really unpleasant feeling because that was one of the things that started to become or one of the many ways in which it started to become unstuck for me is because mm -hmm. I'd be you know I'd end up drinking on a Sunday but then of course I'd feel awful on a Monday so I'd ring in sick but then mm -hmm. you're sat at home on your own with nothing apart from this horrible feeling that you know a drink will get rid of so you end up then drinking mm -hmm. on the Monday and, it, and, and so it goes on and on and on. 
It's a self-sabotage almost, isn't it? Because we know it's not going to help. Like, we're not stupid. We know that having a drink isn't the right thing to do. But we're having a, a chemical imbalance going on in our head where we know that it's going to make us feel better. So we just reach for it because that's what we've always done. And, yeah. I mean, a, yeah. a lot of what we do in this podcast is to say that, you know, you as well, William, are included in this, you know, We've stopped doing that. And a lot of our mm. listeners will think that's not a possibility to stop doing that. But there is, you know, you can stop. We've stopped and you've stopped and you can, you know, get out of that habit. You've got to break the cycle. You've got to break you? the cycle, yeah. But yeah, yeah so yeah. just talking about, because we're going to talk about our listeners here, because I saw we get so caught up in our conversation, we forget that we're yeah. doing yeah, it for our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we do, that's why we say some really odd things. We forget people are listening in. <laughs> um, look, we like to end on a bit of a high for our listeners because we've we're hoping that everything we've just talked about is going to make them think right i am never going to pick up an alcoholic drink again if that is what it does to me that was our aim kind of with this podcast uh, but can we just take it one step further with you william so for our listeners who are thinking about stopping if they were to say right okay i've listened to that podcast alcohol is clearly an awful thing to put into my body I'm going to stop for a week I'm going to give up what changes will happen to them what can they expect to happen to them in that week uh, just one week of not putting the poison into their body so it kind of depends on how heavy and how regular a drinker they are but the first thing let, let, let's assume they're drinking at a fairly high level so I don't know maybe two or three bottles of wine a night the first mm -hmm. thing is the first day is going to be fairly unpleasant from a physical perspective because that anxiety will be there and it will stop them sleeping that night. So they can expect a few nights of having really bad sleep. Um, but when they come out the other side of that, and it does only last like two or three nights, by like in the worst case, by like night three, four, five, they're starting to sleep better. Um, two things will happen. The two main things are that chemical imbalance that's been caused by the alcohol over however many years they've been drinking will start to go back to normal. Now, you may consider yourself to be, um, you know, a fairly strong-willed person, fairly resilient on completely the other way. But the fact of the matter is, you will be the best version of yourself when your brain chemistry goes back to normal. OK, so you can expect to feel more confident, more capable. And, and the best way I can sum it up is just less overwhelmed by the day to day stress and strains of life. OK, because everyone mm -hmm. has ups and downs in life. And when we're drinking, they tend to overpower us and we tend to get overwhelmed very easily because our brain chemistry is all over the place and we haven't got that mental resilience. But of course, the knock on effect of that is as you start sleeping better, that goes up, it's magnified tenfold, okay? And, and this is what I really try to hammer home to people is however good it feels when you have that first drink of the day, you will feel better than that when you are not drinking all the time. And you will have bad days and you won't always feel on top of the world. But compared to when you're drinking, the bad times will seem so much less and you'll be that much more able to sort of get on top of them. Um, yeah. And it just continues to get better. Lucy and I describe it as this wriggly line that our our lives were really chaotic, you know, very up and down. Mm. And sobriety has brought us, you know, it's flattened that line. It makes us more appreciative of what we've got and grateful. And, and that line is a line of contentment. It's a continual line that doesn't change. And it doesn't have those short-lived highs or those deep lows, but it's, it's a definite better way of living, isn't it, Lucy? Oh, totally. Yeah. And it's interesting that you had said uh, about the gift that keeps on giving, William, because we've actually actually talked about sobriety as the gift that keeps on giving yeah that was our does. podcast and I have also described yeah. it as being um as micro dosing ecstasy some days <laughs> you just are so in love with everybody because sobriety <laughs> feels so amazing I mean I I, I um I, I I keep telling people how wonderful they are and just feeling great feelings of warmth you haven't, to you strangers haven't, what, in shops you haven't told, said anything nice to me Lucy the who well, are these strangers no. you're being nice to <laughs> can, you, can you do that a bit more in my direction please oh god dear me I <laughs> 
I've had that. I'm still waiting for that to come. <laughs> just <laughs> strangers. Yeah. No, just I do. To... I feel just really good generally. I have to say, <laughs> William, I have to, I sit very close to Lucy and I've known Lucy. I met her when she was still drinking. We became friends. Um, and three days after she met me, she quit drinking. Right. Um, and the change in Lucy I've witnessed throughout the last year is just incredible, just to see her sitting opposite me now with her bright eyes and lovely clear <laughs> a bushy skin. bushy tail. A bushy tail. <laughs> yes, a little <laughs> nutkins, I call her. <laughs> but, yeah, the change, I mean, for our listeners, I know you can't see Lucy, but she's radiating in oh, front yes, of me. Oh, yes, I am, mm. yes. I just wanted to end, William, with a quote from your book um, because it, I think it's one that our, our listeners will really like because we talk about being sober curious a lot and inclusive in this in this sober world of, of everybody who's questioning their drinking. And I thought this, this part of your book really summed that up well. Um, William says, There is no set test for alcoholism or problem drinking, and there cannot be one. Everyone must consider this issue for themselves. However, someone once said to me that if you are even asking yourself if you have a problem, then you do have one. One definition of a problem is a difficulty that has to be resolved or dealt with. The fact that the question has even crossed your mind means that this is something you are dealing with, something that you are seeking to solve. Thus, by definition, it must be a problem. So that addresses that um, spectrum of alcoholism, like you don't have to be extreme or to reach rock bottoms to deserve professional support, which is always mine and Lucy's message on this podcast is, you know, if you are thinking that you have a problem with alcohol, then perhaps you probably do. So Mm -hmm. we hope this this episode with William has really helped you to understand what's going on with your body and mind, like when you take those drinks. And the book is just amazing, William. I really, truly, (laughs) jokes aside, absolutely loved it. And it's been a significant part of my healing and getting over um, everything and the understanding that a lot of it was kind of out of my control in terms of it being the physical effect of alcohol. Mm. Um, And it's also the kind of book to anyone who's thinking of perhaps getting it that you, you keep with you and you keep reading parts of it and you should if you ever feel like drinking again pick it up and read it because yeah, it'll stop it again. you yeah we just want to thank you William for sorry about the technical issues and right. thank you so much for being the first guest on answering all those questions it's just been a fascinating to hear what you've got to say no thank you for asking me and it's been yeah it's been an honor to be your first ever guest yeah, yeah we're so excited uh, if it's recorded yeah i was be- gonna say we'll probably find that we haven't we haven't hit record yeah that's all right we'll start again yeah we we'll start again or oh, i get another chance to talk to him again vic yeah oh, that'd be nice. yeah. oh yes lucy's rubbing the, her thighs oh god <laughs> don't say that you always have to embarrass us at the end i thought we'd come across as quite professional up until no i don't then. think we came across no? as professional no. at all. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Willie. I was going to sing you your little song that I, I sang to you on Instagram. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, do you want me to count you in? <laughs> you count me in. Okay. Three, two, one. Oh, Mr. Porter, what shall I do? I want to go to Birmingham, but here I am in crew. Take me back to London as quickly as you can. Oh, Mr. Porter, what a silly girl I am. <laughs> well done. This is like, Beautiful. why are you singing that song? Yeah, I'm like, my I. Yeah, that's it. Now, I have never heard that song before of you, William. She reckons it's a really well-known song. It was, I think, in the 1940s it was. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I do sing a bit like Vera Lynn as well. I don't know, I've got some weird you, past life coming to the surface. Have you ever had anyone else sing that song to you? Funnily enough, no. No, that's a one-off. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you're going to do Knees Up Brother Brown next, No, I was going to do maybe it's because I'm a Londoner, <laughs> but I don't think I will. I think I've made enough of a tip of myself for uh, one, yeah, for we one might, podcast. Maybe we'll edit that bit out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll leave it in. Thanks, William, William. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting to us today. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. If you've enjoyed listening to William Porter as much as Lucy and I just did, then be sure to go to his website, alcoholexplained.com. He has a brilliant Instagram account, which is at Alcohol Explained, and we'll be sure to put all the links to his book in the show notes. Also, check out William's Facebook group. It's a brilliant place for sober curious people or anybody treading this sober path. 
We just want to do an extra thank you to William for being our first guest on the Sober Awkward podcast. What a brilliant person to have on. And we really appreciate your time, William. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Sober Awkward podcast. If alcohol is affecting your life in a negative way, if you're struggling to moderate or your hangovers are causing anxiety, it might be time to reach out for help. Contact your local doctor, a therapist or connect with your local AA or sobriety group. Vic's got one. Yes, go onto Facebook and just search Drunk Mummy, Sober Mummy, the group. Lucy and I both agree that even though this journey can be awkward, it's definitely worth it. And if we can do it, you can too. For more support on sobriety, head to Vic's website, drunkmummysobermummy.com. And Lucy runs an online space to support and inspire single mums. Find out more at beanstockmums.com.au. Finally, if you've enjoyed the Sober Awkward podcast, don't forget to follow, subscribe, review and share it with your mates. Don't make it sound like they have to, though. No, they do have to. I'm not doing all this for nothing, Lucy. No, no.